Chapter 26 Alone Is there a reason you're sleeping at the kitchen table? Zach Stad remarked in surprise, entering the room still wearing his pajama pants. Jake's already showering. Wearily, Zach opened his eyes. His neck felt stiff from sleeping on a Bible. His head pounded. He looked at the clock and grimaced. It's ten to eight. I've got to be at work by 8.30. It's going to be hard to function on only three hours of sleep. I'm pleased with the decisions you've been making lately. His father said proudly, realizing Zach had been working on his workbook. You're really taking this study seriously. Are you enjoying it? If you only knew what decision I made last night. Zach thought with shame. I'm loving this study, he said. Let me know if you need any help, his father encouraged. Zach didn't talk much to his brother that Thursday. He wanted to lash out. He wanted to help. And he just didn't know what to say. He needed time to think it over. After work, he had his baptismal interview with Uncle Craig Simons and another older brother in the meeting. It was very similar to his talk with Uncle James. However, Uncle Craig brought in many interesting practical connections to each doctrinal point. Since God is one, Uncle Craig told Zach, we ought to be united in mind and purpose as well. When they discussed the inspiration of the scriptures, Uncle Craig said, Since we know the Bible is the inspired word of God, we need to read it regularly. It's the spirit power that changes our hearts and minds. There were many questions involving a believer's separation from the world, marriage and the Lord, ecclesial activities and responsibilities, politics, and making wise choices regarding the influence of the media. All who heard Zach's confession of faith were satisfied with his knowledge of the gospel message and personal commitment to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Plans were made in earnest for his baptism that Sunday. On Friday morning, as the twins drove into work just after eight, it was already abnormally hot. A heat wave was stretching from Boston all the way up to Nova Scotia, and they knew it was going to be a difficult day out in the sun. Zach still didn't have much to say to his brother. He was still angry that Jake had purposefully talked him into watching Hell Rider. Thinking over some of the issues they had discussed at his interview the night before, he remembered one passage in particular. Uncle Craig showed me an interesting passage last night, he told his brother. Really? Jake didn't look over. Yeah, in Romans chapter 1, it lists many things that God considers wickedness, and then says, Who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. What about it? Uncle Craig says we shouldn't take pleasure in watching or reading about sin. Why are you telling me this? Jake, you know why. Turning the car radio up loudly, Jake made it clear this was not something he wanted to discuss. His own conscience was trouble enough. He didn't want to hear it from his brother. Zach knew they needed to talk about Jake's new obsession at some point, but he still wasn't sure what he was going to say or do. He could just be a rat and tell his dad about the laptop, but Jake would know who had squealed. He didn't feel he should break the bond of trust that they had always shared in their relationship. Somehow, he thought, the better way is to convince my brother to stop watching bad stuff. How can I do it if he doesn't even want to talk about it? As usual, the twins spent the day mowing and weed whipping while Derek and Alan pruned and tidied the gardens. It was difficult working in the hot sun. They all had to take frequent water breaks. When Zach and Jake arrived home, they convinced each other to brave the heat and do their new exercise routine. However, after only the second set of rim jumps and treks up the hill, Zach felt sick to his stomach and had to stop. Sorry, Jake, he said. I can't finish today. It's too hot. Walking into the house, Zach was discouraged that he was taking so long to get back into shape. Jake was way ahead of him in everything. He took to Advil, but his head continued to pound. The ice cubes melted quickly in the large glass of water he poured for himself. Their house wasn't air-conditioned. It was difficult to sit down and study Friday evening, knowing his brother had gone to the movies with Melissa. No lies had been told. Jake didn't have to explain where he was going, since his parents had left after dinner to visit old friends. Esther had gone to stay overnight with another family in the meeting. Zach felt very alone. He was sure the movie theater was air-conditioned. At home, they had only fans. It was rarely so hot in Nova Scotia. I could still get there in time, Zach thought. I wonder what the rating is for Columbia. How close are they sitting? It was hard to fight against the strong magnetic pull to go, to be with Melissa, to see another racy movie. I can't go, Zach told himself. I'm getting baptized this Sunday. I'm making a commitment to leave the world behind. 
Zach emailed Hannah for some moral support, but there was no instant response. The house phone rang, and Zach ran to pick it up eagerly, hoping it might be one of his friends. It was Aunt Sandra. Hi, Zach, she said anxiously. May, may I speak to your mom or dad, please? Sorry, they're out right now. Do you want me to tell them to give you a call? Please. There was a little catch in Aunt Sandra's voice that gave Zach concern. How is Uncle James doing? He asked. Is he over that cold yet? No, it just gets worse and worse, she replied despairingly. I don't know what to do. He's finished the antibiotics and is a little better, but he seems so hot tonight. I know it's a hot night, but I think he has a fever. Would you know if your mom has a thermometer? I can't find ours. I'll check, Zach told her. The first aid kit in the bathroom was well stocked. He found a thermometer easily. Without a car, Zach was unable to take the thermometer over, but his aunt came and picked it up. She didn't stay long, and her face was lined with worry. She left saying, If your Uncle James has a fever, I'll be taking him back to the doctor Monday morning. Sitting down at the kitchen table, Zach tried to focus his thoughts, but he was having difficulty concentrating. Walking around the house in a daze, he decided to check his emails on the family computer. Jaden had sent through an email with an itinerary for his trip to Uganda. Zach looked at it with interest. Building homes for needy widows and orphans in a foreign land sounded like an exciting adventure. He was impressed to read all the ways that Jaden and Isaiah had fundraised for the mission, especially the last one. For a whole week, Jaden and Isaiah had run a mini basketball camp for the novice division. Twenty neighborhood kids had participated. Cool idea, guys, he thought. I love your spirit. There were also emails from his older sisters congratulating him on his decision to be baptized. The oldest begged for the service to be put on Skype so she could watch it happen. Then Zach opened an email from Uncle Peter and Aunt Jessica. It read, Dear Zach, we are so pleased to hear that you decided to give your life to Christ. You are making the best decision ever. We are very thankful God has called you to join his family and find salvation in his son. Your dad says you plan to go back to school for another year, even though you have all the credits you need to graduate. We know that it's very important for us all to consider our future plans wisely. One day, if Jesus still hasn't returned, you will need to have a good job that can support a family. But just in case you're open to taking a year off before you delve into the commitment of college or university, Aunt Jessica and I would love to invite you and Jake to spend a year with us in Jamaica. There's so much that could be done here with the children and teens. Remember the Bible skits that you and Jake used to put on for us? They were so well done and entertaining. Remember the kingdom feast when you dressed up as the king and your beard kept falling off? You guys are hams. If we had the two of you with us, we could run some vacation Bible camps throughout the year and even set up a youth program. Please give it your consideration. We could really use your help spreading the gospel message in this island country. We'll be thinking of you and praying for you next Sunday. God be with you in your new life walking with him. Love, Uncle Peter, Aunt Jessica, Susanna, Jimmy, and Seth. At the end of Uncle Peter's email was a passage in a blue font from Luke chapter 9, which said, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? This was the second time Uncle Peter had personally invited him and Jake to help in Jamaica. Interesting idea, Zach pondered. But his heart was set on winning the provincials. To leave school and go to Jamaica for a year would require giving up basketball, his friends, and the opportunity to improve his chemistry mark and get his top university choice. However, Uncle Peter's quote caught his eye. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? He remembered Uncle Mark had closed his devotion at camp with a similar passage. Zach closed the emails and went back to the kitchen, intending to get on with the workbook. Sitting down, he didn't pick up his pen. Resting his throbbing head in his hands, he wondered, Could I give up basketball? What if I try to play next season and, and get another concussion? Will it be a wasted year of my life? I might not get my top university choice with my poor chemistry mark, but surely I'll get into most programs. My math marks are good. How cool it would be to spend a year with Uncle Peter. Imagine having the freedom to give my life totally in service to God. Maybe God is calling me to do this. But Jake will really think I'm a fanatic. Maybe I could talk Jake into coming. Brett will be devastated. Is Brett more important than God? 
No, he thought with a deep sigh, sitting up straight in his chair. But I just can't give up next year. I've got to get better grades for university. I've got to think of my future. I'll be missing out on making money working with Eden Tree. And Brett is counting on Jake and me to help win the provincials. Dismissing Uncle Peter's appeal, Zack picked up his pen and looked at his workbook. He was on chapter 29. Job's righteousness was a shining example. He is blameless and upright, Zack marveled as he read through the chapter. Job cared for the widows, the orphans, the lame, and the blind. He gave them what they needed and defended their cause. Have I ever looked after anyone that's needy when there's no benefit to myself? Thinking hard for a few minutes, Zack failed to remember any such occurrence. Is that what missionary work would be like? He wondered. Taking a few gulps of water from his tall glass and still feeling slow and sluggish, Zack read through an article his dad had given him on the life of Job. He was interested to read that one of the benefits of Job's suffering was the education of his friends. His friends had misconceptions about God and the way that God worked in the life of a believer. At the end of Job's sufferings, God commanded Job to pray for his friends so that they could have forgiveness for their harsh words and false statements about God. Ironically, the man the friends had condemned in their speeches was the very man God told to pray for their forgiveness. Job was a type of Christ, Zach marveled. He was condemned by the very people he came to save. In the agony of crucifixion, Jesus brought salvation to the world. Zach sat back, deep in thought. What's my responsibility to the world? To, to my friends? He considered. Would God ever use my life for the benefit of someone else? He remembered his decision at camp to help Melissa find truth. He hadn't tried anything since he'd come home. And Melissa wasn't the only friend that needed help. There was Jaden and David and Abby and Jerry. I'm going to phone them all and invite them to come to my baptism, he decided. He phoned everyone, but most of his friends were out and he had to leave messages. The only one who answered his call was Abby, and she was eager to come. I'll be there as long as my parents give me a ride, she told him. Abby was with her parents at their cottage on the peninsula near Sydney, a three-hour drive from Stirling. Generally, she and her family stayed at their cottage all summer long. Zach hoped her parents would choose to make the trip. Turning back to his study, he investigated the references to wisdom in Job chapter 28. Job had asked, But where can wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Job went on to say that wisdom is not found in the land of the living or in the depths of the sea. It can't be bought with even the finest gold. The chapter concludes by stating that only God knows where wisdom is found. Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. Following various links to wisdom in the Bible, Zach discovered that true wisdom is an understanding and appreciation that God's laws are vastly superior to our own sense of right and wrong. When he came to Proverbs 4, he read the whole chapter. Hear, my children, the instruction of a father, and give attention to no understanding. Let your heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and in all your getting, get understanding. Exalt her, that she may promote thee. She will place on your head an ornament of grace. Just like Job before he was afflicted, Zach marveled. Because Job loved God's ways, he became renowned as a man of wisdom. When he spoke, people listened, because he spoke and lived the words of God. He read on. Take firm hold of instruction. Do not let go. Keep her, for she is your life. The way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them, and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Keep your heart with all diligence, Zach pondered when he went to bed that night, for out of it spring the issues of life. The decisions I make are made from what's in my heart, he considered, lying on his bed in the dark. It was a very dark night, and a strong wind was blowing. Jake still wasn't home. I need to guard my heart, Zack told himself. I need to keep God's wisdom flowing in. The biggest battle I need to fight is the one inside of me, the battle in my heart. As he lay there, thinking over these thoughts, he recalled a point his father had made during the readings one night. We must be born of water 
and of the Spirit, he had said. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Jesus' words are spirit and life. It's by taking in the words of life that Christ is formed in us, that a new man is born. It was shortly after three in the morning when Zach woke up to an intense thunderstorm. He was startled to hear someone fiddling with his bedroom window. Slowly, it slid open. Someone was coming through the ground floor window. Shh, Jake whispered with a grin as he landed on the carpet, dripping wet. I don't want Mom and Dad to know I'm home this late. Wearily, Zach looked up at his alarm clock. It's after three, Jake, he whispered back. How many movies did you watch? Only one, Jake smiled with a shrug, pulling off his wet clothes. Melissa wanted to go for a walk. It was great until the rain started. She broke up with Shane, so she's feeling rather lonely. With a quiet chuckle, he added. She asked about you. With a groan, Zach put his pillow over his head. I don't want to hear any more. Wrapping himself in a blanket, Jake sat down on his brother's bed. He pulled the pillow off his brother. Zach, he said. You've got to be honest with me. Zach rolled over. About what? About Melissa. I won't move in on your girl if you still care about her. Seriously. She's not my girl, but of course I care about her. Zach replied passionately. He sat up in bed. Jake, I'm choosing this Sunday to commit my life to God. I'm not going to date someone who doesn't share that commitment, and you shouldn't either. Melissa needs help to find God's truth, but she will drag you down in a dating situation. Come on, Jake. Zach pleaded. You know you would have been telling me the same thing a month ago. Melissa doesn't know that morality matters. Probably not, Jake agreed. But you've had your fun while I've been trying to do everything right all these years. I just want to break free for a bit. Not in any crazy way. I just want to experience life a little. That doesn't sound good, Jake. You had your fun, and I covered for you, right? But Jake, I'm choosing to leave it all behind. And you're already baptized. I can tell you the fun wasn't worth it. It didn't do me any good. It almost took me completely away from God. I'll probably make the same choice as you, eventually. Jake replied evenly, leaving Zach's bed and climbing into his own. Just cut me some slack. Let me find my own way like you found yours. Perplexed and unsure how he should respond, Zach didn't say anything more. However, he felt very torn up inside as he wondered, What does Jake feel he's missing out on? And what's he planning to do? Something's happening to my brother, and it's probably Melissa. Will she go out with him? Zack thought it all over carefully as Jake drifted off to sleep. He groaned. He knew that compared to Shane and the other guys Melissa had dated, Jake would seem like the perfect gentleman. If Melissa fell for me, I guess I shouldn't be surprised if she falls for my twin brother. But what's this going to do to him? It can't be good. Maybe I should involve Dad. Or should I just let Jake figure this out on his own? Chapter 27. Into the Water Determined to invite all his friends to witness his baptism, Zach made several attempts to contact everyone. His final round of calls included one to Jaden, and this time he was able to leave a message with Jaden's mom. A baptism? She repeated incredulously. Why are you going to all that trouble, honey? Just believe in your heart and you will be saved. Zach had a few passages ready in case anyone asked him that question, and Jaden's mom listened politely as he explained why he believed baptism was essential to salvation. When he called Melissa, he was happy that she answered. Melissa was eager to talk, but rather confused with the concept. While she wasn't in a hurry to end the conversation, Zach found it difficult to explain his decision to someone who didn't even believe God existed. While Melissa wasn't really sure what she believed about the origins of life or the existence of a higher power, she was firmly convinced that such discussions didn't matter. I really like you, Zach, she told him, but I'm not interested in becoming a Christian. There are way too many dumb rules. Zach knew well in advance that Melissa wouldn't be coming on Sunday. He hung up the phone feeling even more worried about Jake's budding relationship with her. He soon learned that some of his youth group friends wouldn't be there either. David's family was away on vacation, and Jerry was in Truro for a soccer tournament. On Zach's special Sunday morning, Jaden was one of the first to arrive at the small white Christelphian Hall just outside of Sterling. 
He was pushing his brother Isaiah in his wheelchair. Hey guys, thanks for coming. Zach greeted them. This is a cool thing that you're doing, man. Jaden exclaimed, flashing a bright smile. I've never seen a baptism before. Gotta say, I'm rather curious. Yeah. Isaiah agreed. Very curious. Mom would have come too, only she's helping out at the food bank this morning. Brett filed in behind Jaden and gave Zach an encouraging clap on the back. I'm so happy to be here today. Glad you're joining the club. Knowing that Zach would be sitting at the front with his family filling the row of seats, Brett invited Jaden and his brother to sit with him. Joining the club? Seemed like an odd statement to Zach. He pondered the phrase as he helped his father set up Skype so that his sisters in Ottawa could watch the service. Once Skype was up and running, he chatted to his sisters while everyone was filing into the hall. Of all his Sunday school friends, Abby was the only one who came. She and her mom walked through the door just after the organ voluntary had begun. Mom drove me here, she whispered quietly to Zach as she slipped into the row behind him. Looking over appreciatively at Abby's mom, Zach said, Thanks. No problem, she smiled graciously. Abby really wanted to come. Sitting at the front of the small meeting hall with Jake on one side and his parents and sister on the other, Zach reflected on how much his life had changed. I've changed because of what I've read and heard, Zach thought. Look at what God's word has done to me. I was rebellious and full of myself, and God reached out and turned me in the opposite direction. Here I am committing my life to him. Today I'm choosing, like Moses, to give up the life of Egypt and all the pleasures this world has to offer. I'm choosing to take up my cross and follow Jesus. Zach pulled out a new notebook and pen as Craig Simons rose to give the exhortation that morning. Uncle Craig, as Zach had always affectionately called him, was Uncle Peter's father-in-law and had taught the twins in Sunday school for the last four years. Completely gray and very lean, Uncle Craig's blue eyes sparkled with conviction. He and his wife were still enthusiastically involved in nearly every outreach activity organized by the Ecclesia. Good morning, brothers and sisters, and a special good morning to Zach. Uncle Craig began. I'm very pleased that Zach is making this commitment to his Heavenly Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. When I first began teaching the twins in the senior Sunday school class four years ago, Zach and Jake were keen and capable students. Many times the questions that they asked caused me to go home with more homework than I assigned them. There was some muffled laughter. We had some great sessions early on. And then... Uncle Craig recalled. As time went on, those questions gradually ceased. There were Sundays when I wasn't sure anyone was listening. He paused for a moment. Zach, he said, looking directly at him, I'm so thankful to see enthusiasm in your eyes again. Whatever happened this summer has been for your good, and I'm very happy God has led you to this decision. With a smile, Zach nodded. He knew what had happened. He had finally taken time to listen to God's call. He had finally realized he was a sinner in need of forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Jake fidgeted restlessly with the ribbon in his Bible. He was finding it harder and harder to concentrate on Sunday mornings. With all the movies he was watching and the creepy novels he was reading and the Snapchat photo Melissa had sent him that morning, never mind the intense texting conversations, there were too many enticing fantasies pulling him in other directions. He had started sowing to the flesh, and inevitably, and sadly, he was reaping corruption. Master Sin was adding shackles to his willing slave, one by one. I'd like to talk this morning about repentance, Uncle Craig said, because that's what baptism is all about. We confess our sin, our need for forgiveness in Christ, and our decision to crucify the flesh and walk in the Spirit. When we do wrong, Craig continued, we usually feel sorry for what we've done. But it's interesting to note that there are two different types of sorry. One leads to life, and one leads to death. Let's read from 2 Corinthians 7, verses 8 to 11. Uncle Craig asked everyone to turn to the passage. He explained that the Apostle Paul had been upset with the Corinthians in his first letter, because they were allowing one of their members to continue in a sinful situation without rebuke. But when a second letter to the Corinthians was written, the Apostle Paul was able to praise them, because they had listened to his warning, were sorry for their wrongdoing, and had changed the situation. Reading from chapter 7, verse 10, from the NIV, Uncle Craig read, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation, and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. It's possible to be sorry for what we've done, but not to change anything in our hearts. Uncle Craig continued. We see it easily in our children. Little Freddy takes a lollipop from the candy jar without asking. If no one discovers his theft, Little Freddy quite happily enjoys the treat. When he is caught and punished, there may be plenty of tears, 
But are those tears because Freddy is truly ashamed and sorry that he stole? Or is he crying because he got caught and can't have any treats for the rest of the week? Uncle Craig smiled. The test is whether little Freddy steals again the next time he has a chance, or chooses to avoid the temptation. Think of Judas Iscariot. Uncle Craig elaborated. He was very sorry that he had betrayed Jesus. So sorry was Judas for his actions that he cast down the money he'd been paid in the temple, proclaimed that he had betrayed an innocent man, and took his own life. Judas's sorrow is not the kind that will lead us to God's salvation. Godly sorrow leads us to change our heart and behavior. Godly sorrow leads us to confess our sins, ask for forgiveness, and to find help to overcome our weakness. Judas's sorrow was of the worldly sort, which only leads to despair and death. The disciple Peter also betrayed Jesus that same night through his fearful denials. Yet Peter's sorrows led to his humbling and a complete change of heart. He became a stronger man, prepared to proclaim Jesus Christ regardless of persecution. Zach looked over at Jake to share his enthusiasm for the things that were being said, but Jake was staring out the window with a smile on his face. He seemed far away in thought. As Uncle Craig went on to give another example, citing Esau's worldly sorrow over losing his birthright, how he sought it carefully with tears but found no way to change his father's mind, Zach began to wonder what Jake was thinking about. As he did this, he quickly found his own thoughts in places that he didn't want them to be. How could I be thinking these thoughts? Zach tried it himself. Here I am, about to give my life to God, and my mind is in the gutter. Taking notes and harnessing his thoughts to concentrate on the words being spoken made a difference. It helped. Uncle Craig then talked about Joseph, the joy Joseph must have felt when he saw his brother Judah's heartfelt distress over Benjamin's plight. The joy of knowing that Judah was now more concerned about their father's feelings than his own. He referred to David's sin with Bathsheba and the months that dragged on before David was fully convicted in his heart that he had sinned and was unworthy before God. Godly sorrow is all about changing hearts, Uncle Cray continued. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20, we are given some good advice. I want to pass this advice on to you today, Zach. From the NIV, Uncle Craig read, My son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Don't let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to a man's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. That's the very same passage I was reading just the other night, Zach realized. How can a young man keep his way pure? Uncle Craig asked, quoting from Psalm 119. By living according to your word. I have hidden your word in my heart, that I might not sin against you. This is the way to change hearts, Uncle Craig continued. Jesus overcame his temptations because the word of God was in his heart. God looks in the heart. He is looking for hearts that willingly choose him and truly love his ways. Let his word live in you, Zach, that he might guide your life, just as he had for your brother Jake. Uncle Craig smiled across at Jake as he said this. Hearing his name, Jake escaped from his daydreams. With a weak smile in return, Jake felt decidedly uneasy at being held up as a good example for Zach to follow. He had been imagining himself driving up to Melissa's house in the bright yellow Corvette that he had seen for sale on the side of the road that morning. Now, what exactly was Uncle Craig saying when he mentioned my name? Today, Zach, Uncle Craig continued, you've changed your allegiance. You are choosing to no longer willingly serve King Sin. Before everyone here, you are choosing to give your life, your heart, and your mind to your Father in Heaven and serve Him. Today you are thankful that Jesus, your Savior, absolutely gave his heart, mind, and life to his Father, providing all of us with forgiveness and showing us the way to live. There will be days ahead when you will fail, days when you will disappoint yourself and your Heavenly Father in the decisions that you make, or the things you do, or don't do. Forgiveness is available to you, Zach. Don't despair or give up like Judas. Don't deny your sin, as David did for months in utter misery. Don't serve insincerely, like Esau, completely despising the great birthright. And don't neglect a dying love in your heart. Nurture it with the word and prayer. Take away the thorns. Confess your sins. Repent and go forward, forsaking the evil way. Zach nodded as he scribbled down the message. He was encouraged. His heart was open to the words. 
The words might have had an impact on Jake as well if his thoughts had not drifted off again, estimating how much money he was going to make with Eden Tree that summer. After the exhortation, hymns were sung while Zach changed clothes and headed over with his family to the small lake that was within walking distance of the hall. The others followed soon afterwards, setting the laptop carefully on a nearby stump so that his sisters could watch. His father baptized him, taking him down into the water, put off the old man of the flesh, and bringing him up a new man dedicated to God. It was a high calling, but Zach knew it was the only decision with an eternal promise of life. His family and several others gave him big hugs when he came up out of the water, and on Skype his sisters were cheering. At the end of the service there was, as usual, a prayer for the brethren, when special requests were made for any brother or sister in need. Zach's dad gave this prayer, and his most earnest request was that God would be with his sick brother James. He asked that he would soon find health and strength to recover, and that Aunt Sandra would be strong in faith. The only sadness for Zach on his day of rejoicing was the absence of two of the most important people in his life. Texts are pouring in for you, Jake told him after the service was over. He showed his brother the phone. All their old friends in Ontario were sending messages to congratulate Zach on his baptism. All his absent aunts and uncles had sent texts as well. Jake was reading the messages with his brother. He pointed out the one from Hannah. It said, Zach, I'm so happy I've made this decision and that you have too. I now know where I'm going in life. We belong to Christ now and for always. Happy new birthday, twin. Love, Hannah. You've got a new twin, Jake remarked. We've been born again on the same day. True. I have something for you, Abby said on her way out of the meeting hall. She smiled and passed Zach a small packet. Zach looked at her with surprise. Several of the older members of the Ecclesia had given him helpful books to commemorate his baptism, but it was a total surprise to get something from Abby. He took the package appreciatively. I hope you'll wear it, she said with a bright smile. If I ever decide to get baptized, I think I'd wear something like this. Then I could tell everyone about it. Peeling back the layers, Zach uncovered a braided leather bracelet. Something was engraved on the rectangular metal plate in the middle. Zach held it up close to see the words, A new man in Christ, it said. Abby, this is amazing, Zach marveled. Yeah, I'll definitely wear it. Thanks so much. You're welcome, she smiled. Seeing Zach fumble the tie on, Abby offered to help. It was much easier to fasten with two hands. So when are you going to be baptized? He asked her tentatively as she tied the cords. The question came out awkwardly. Zach wasn't used to encouraging his friends in a spiritual way. Looking down, Abby shrugged her shoulders. I have to clean up my act first, she mumbled. I can relate to that, Zach nodded. He paused, but as much as he was unaccustomed to encouraging his friends in spiritual ways, he suddenly felt compelled to try harder. Abby is a good friend, he reasoned. She's been there for me when I needed her. The bracelet was such a kind gift. What have I ever done for her? Nothing, except view her as competition. He gave her a hug. Don't wait too long, Abby, he said earnestly as they parted. Remember, Uncle Craig said it's not about being perfect, you know. It's about being sorry. Come on, Abby, her mom called out from a distance. It's a three-hour trip back. Why don't you come with Alan and me to youth conference? Zach said on the spur of the moment. I had such a great time at Manitoulin. It was so good to see everyone again. I learned so much. It helped me to make this change. Abby sighed. Oh, I don't know. I have a lot planned already. I'm supposed to be going to Brian's cottage with his family that week. In Zach's mind, there could hardly have been a worse excuse. A week at Brian's cottage would pull Abby in the opposite direction. Look, I'll send you the workbook if you send me your email address. I'll help you with it over the phone or, or however we can. You'll love it, Abby. I know you will. I'll send you my email, she said half-heartedly. Turning away to head out with her mom, Abby gave Zach a parting glance. Her eyes were troubled, and Zach felt at a loss to help. He was surprised by how much he had already said. Since when did he pressure people like that? But he knew that deep down Abby wanted to change. She just couldn't see her way out of the situation she had chosen to enter. Little did Zach know that he would never see Abby's face again. Neither one of them realized how quickly time was running out. No one did. The door would soon be shut. The opportunity to repent and find forgiveness was coming to an end. Jaden and Isaiah came over and marveled at the pile of books Zach had been given. 
While their church was very actively involved in the community and helping out all over the world, Bible study was not emphasized. They're expecting you to do lots of reading, Jaden said, picking up a book that caught his attention. With a laugh, Zach told them, If you see anything you like, feel free to borrow it. Until youth conference is over, I'll be flat out studying Job every night. So if it's not about Job, I will probably won't get to it until the fall. Really? Isaiah looked at the books eagerly. He had a longing to learn more. Jaden examined the book he had picked up. It was called Stormy Wind, Fulfilling His Word. This one looks interesting. It's about historical battles, which I love to read. Sure you don't mind? No, take more if you like. You've got another month of holidays. I'll be off to Uganda tomorrow, Jaden reminded him quietly. But I could use some reading material on the flight. Right, all the best with that, Zack exclaimed. How much did you guys raise for house building? Ten thousand dollars, Isaiah cheered. Are you serious? Didn't you see our picture in the paper last week? Jaden asked. Zack shook his head uneasily. Sorry, guys, I rarely read the paper. But send me a copy if you can. I'd love to see it. Sitting down, Jaden examined the rest of the books and showed some to Isaiah. Many of the topics and Bible characters were unfamiliar, but... Hey, look, he said to his brother. Here's one on Jonathan, my favorite Bible hero. Isaiah beamed. Can I borrow this? Zach laughed. Of course. Looking down at all the books, Zach picked out one that he thought would cover the important teachings of the Bible. You can borrow this too, he said to the brothers. It's about the simple gospel message. I'll be interested to hear what you think about it. Okay, his friend agreed. I'll read this, and then we'll have a discussion. It's about time. Yeah, it probably is, Zack admitted. That night after dinner, Jake handed Zack the confiscated smartphone. Dad wants to talk to you in the kitchen, he said, looking very upset. You're getting it back early. Surprise, Zack took the phone eagerly and headed to the kitchen. I know this is being returned to you before summer is over, his father told him. But I realize the need you have to keep in touch with your friends in Ontario. I just hope that the contacts you make with this device will be as helpful to you in your new walk in Christ as I hope you will be to them. Use it wisely, Zach. It can be a tool for good, but it can just as easily lead to evil. I'll use it wisely, Zach said. Looking serious for a moment, Zach's dad added, I had Jake show me a printout of that phone's texting history. There seems to be thousands of messages sent first by you and then Jake to one particular number. I don't know who that particular number belongs to, but I am hoping it isn't responsible for the decline I've witnessed in both my boys while they were contacting it so frequently. Would you have any opinion on the matter? Melissa has been a problem for both of us, Zach admitted freely. I thought as much, his dad replied. Is there any way I can help? Bible camp helped me, Zach told him. I realize how much I needed good friends. Maybe you can take Jake on a long car ride and, and have a talk to him. He needs your help. Nodding thoughtfully, Zach's dad agreed this was a good idea. I'll see what I can do, he said, and he fully intended to follow through with the plan. In the past, fishing trips had been a good option for long, private conversations, or even a hike along the Ocean View Trail. However, Andrew didn't comprehend the urgency. Like everyone else, Andrew had no idea how close they were to the last day, the very last day before Christ's return. Too preoccupied with finishing the course he needed for September and handling a multitude of difficult pastoral issues in the ecclesia, he was only vaguely aware that his son had been hijacked by King Sin. He had no idea that Jake needed to be saved with fear pulling him out of the fire. Unfortunately, his son's needs were too far down on his long list of priorities to instigate any deep conversations that week. As Zach walked back to his room, he checked his text message history. Very few messages had come through to him after his friends had realized he'd had his phone confiscated. There wasn't a trace of the thousands that had gone out to the one particular number his father had mentioned. The entire history on that thread had been deleted, but the ten-second photo flash and some very intimate conversation would remain in one young man's memory for life. Chapter 28. Bad News All week long, there were predictions that a major hurricane was heading toward the east coast. 
Hurricane Kennedy was to reach Nova Scotia sometime by Tuesday. It was classified as a Category 4 storm. Many people, including the Bryants, boarded up their windows. Some tried to be prepared by cutting down dead trees and limbs to prevent them from falling on their houses and cars. Scores of people left the coastal regions and headed further inland. Tuesday night, the hurricane hit. Kennedy was downgraded to a Category 3 when it hit land, but even so, the wind and rain were thunderous. Zack and his family barely slept. Garbage cans rattled down the street, trees groaned and scraped against the house. Every so often, loud cracks and booms were heard as branches broke off and fell to the ground. Huddled around their clock radio, the boys listened to the coastal storm surge warnings and incoming damage reports until suddenly electricity cut out. Zack's phone alarm woke them up the next morning. The power was off, and it was still raining heavily. Even though it was 7 o'clock in the morning, Zack could barely see through the dark gloominess that enveloped them. Trees close to the house were bent over with the wind, and the lawn was covered with water. Broken branches lay everywhere. There would be no gardening work today. As he and Jake headed to the kitchen for breakfast, Zack's cell rang. It was Aunt Sandra. In an anxious tone, she asked to speak to his dad. The boys could only hear one side of the conversation as they set the table for breakfast. From their father's alarmed responses, they gathered that someone was seriously hurt or sick. Uncle James is in the hospital, their father said after ending the phone call. Aunt Sandra took him in last night before the storm hit. She says he's contracted pneumonia of all things. His oxygen levels have dropped dangerously below normal, so they've admitted him, and he's on a powerful antibiotic drip. How serious is that? Zack asked with concern. Uncle James is very special to him. Will he be in for a day or a week or what? I wouldn't think there'd be more than a couple of days, his father assured him. They have pretty strong meds to clear up stuff like that. The rain finally stopped late Wednesday night. Thursday morning, the Bryants joined an army of volunteers to clear the main roads. There was a lot of damage all over Sterling. By Friday, the main highways reopened, but many side streets were still a mess of fallen tree branches and flooding. When they contacted Aunt Sandra to check on Uncle James' well-being, they found out that while she had finally made it home that Friday morning, so many branches had fallen at Ocean View Lodge she was unable to get up her driveway. I'll see if I can head over there today and clean it up, Zach's dad told his mom. Maybe Esther can help me, and you can spend some time with Sandra and my mom. It sounds like they would appreciate your company, Zach's mom agreed. After they had helped the neighbors cut up and remove a few large limbs that had fallen on their street, the twins' parents and Esther headed to Ocean View Lodge, while the boys headed to work. Almost every Eden Tree customer had trees down. The heavy rain had eroded gardens and lawns. Along the coastline, rogue waves had wreaked havoc inland. There would be no shortage of work for a while. When the boys arrived home that evening, tired, wet, and muddy, their parents had exciting news. Uncle Peter and Aunt Jessica were flying home from their missionary work in Jamaica to see Uncle James and spend time with their family. They'd been planning to get back for a visit anyhow, Zach's mom explained when Zach's eyes widened with the news. They've been gone almost a year now, so it would be really good to see them again. Is Uncle James going to be okay? Zach asked, wondering if this sudden visit meant his uncle was in critical condition. I would think so, his mom said reassuringly. But Zach could tell she was uncertain. Esther was thrilled with the news that little Susanna, Jimmy, and Seth were coming home for a couple of weeks. Hearing that they were planning to stay at the Bryant's Ocean View Lodge, she began thinking up fun activities to do with them. Their favorite was always to go to the beach and hunt for shells, crabs, and little lobsters. However, when the twins had gone to their rooms to change and their parents thought everyone was out of hearing range, Zach heard his dad say to his mom, His heart condition has the doctors worried. The pneumonia is putting more strain on him than his heart can handle. Zach heard his mom gasp. Thomas and Purity are also coming with Peter and Jess. He heard his father say. Even Kara is flying in from Ontario. They should all arrive tonight. Do we need to pick them up? Craig is looking after it. The McKinleys had offered their van so that everyone can get around while they are here. God bless them, his mother sighed. We have such wonderful friends. Now, Zach was alarmed. As fit and healthy as Uncle James looked, He knew his uncle's heart would always be weak after the attack he had suffered years before. It alarmed him that so many friends and family members were coming. Please, Heavenly Father. Zach pleaded earnestly. Don't let Uncle James die. We need him here. Esther overheard her parents' conversation as well. When the twins headed outside to do their exercise routine, she followed. 
As they did their warm-up stretches, she asked, Who is Kara? Mom says she's coming in from Ontario. How does she know Uncle James? Knowing that his sister knew Uncle Thomas and Aunt Purity, Zach explained that Kara Lavelle was Uncle Thomas's mother. Likely she's coming here especially to see Uncle Thomas and Aunt Purity, Jake surmised, stretching from side to side. Since they've been in Jamaica for a year with Uncle Peter and Aunt Jessica. She has some connections to us, too. Zach added proudly. Because her daughter Verity used to be really good friends with Uncle Peter. Until she died, that is. Really? Asked her product. Someone died? I don't think I've heard this story. Who? When? What's this all about? Pulling on one hamstring muscle, Jake began to tell the story. When Uncle Peter lived in Ontario, he went to high school with Uncle Thomas, Aunt Purity, and Verity. He first became friends with Verity, and I've heard he was really in love with her. But, but then she died of cancer. When she was only 16, Zach added emphatically, following his brother's lead in the warm-up routine. But she had already found the truth and was baptized, and that led to Uncle Thomas becoming a believer and his mom, Aunt Carol Lovell. And then Uncle Peter became a believer. Jake said with a smile as he jogged on the spot, pulling his knees up extra high. Uncle Peter told our family all about the true gospel message. So really, all of us should be thankful for Verity. Just think, she was younger than we are while she was searching for truth. Zach exclaimed. Esther sat down in the curb. The grass was still too wet from the storm. She was curious. Okay, so then how did Uncle Peter end up with Aunt Jessica? Isn't she a lot younger than him? Passing a basketball to his brother, Jake replied, Uncle Peter and Verity used to visit the Simons when they were reading and discussing the Bible. So when Uncle Peter first met Aunt Jess, she was just a little girl in their house. After Verity died, Uncle Peter took off to Australia. Zach continued, as he and Jake began passing the basketball back and forth. They were eager to start in their rim-jumping, hill-run routine. When Uncle Peter came back to Canada ten years later, Uncle James had just had a heart attack. He was living here in Nova Scotia. Uncle Peter wanted to stay out here and be with his brother. Since the Simons had moved here by then, he lived with them. And that's when he really got to know Aunt Jess. Jake smiled, driving a bounce pass hard at his brother. Zach caught it, faked him out, and gave him a surprise pass behind the back. Esther was thinking it all through carefully. So how long has Verity been dead then? Zach wasn't exactly sure. As he and Jake gave each other increasingly difficult passes, he made a rough estimate. Mm, probably around 20 years. That's a long time, she considered sadly. I really like Uncle Thomas. I wish I'd had the chance to meet his sister. Maybe you will at the resurrection, Zach called out, missing his brother's pass and running to catch the ball before it went on the road. Jake began his rim jumps, and Zach tossed the ball to Esther and joined him. Esther sat and watched the boys for a while as she thought about all the connections she hadn't realized existed. Uncle Peter loves someone else before Aunt Jess, she pondered. And that girl died young. How sad. She was Uncle Thomas's sister. Because of her, our family became believers. When the boys began their third hill run, she went inside to help make dinner. Chapter 29, The Invitation Melissa! Zach called out as he slammed on his brakes. He was on his way to Ocean View Lodge Saturday morning when he saw her. There was still a lot of cleanup to do from the hurricane. His brother Jake was helping Brett with his yard, and Esther and his parents had gone in early that morning to visit Uncle James. Zach hadn't seen Melissa for weeks, and now she was standing on the street corner waiting for the light to turn so that she could cross the road. Swerving right quickly, Zach took the closest parking spot on the downtown street. Melissa pranced over in sparkly high-heeled sandals. With a summer tan and blonde highlights, she looked even prettier than he remembered. Hey, Zach, she called with a merry laugh. I haven't seen you all summer. Never a modest dresser, Melissa was at her skimpiest in the heat. Leaning into his open window, she rested her arms on the ledge. He could smell her sweet, enticing scent. A wisp of her silky hair blew across his face. Giggling, she tucked the stray piece behind her ears. Alluring images flashed across Zach's mind. I can't believe it's been over two months since we did the musical, she giggled again. Zach nodded. Has it been over two months? He exclaimed. Mentally, he calculated that almost ten weeks had passed. Think you'd remember how to do the whirlybird catch? Zach laughed. They had practiced that move more than any other. He had no trouble remembering the steps, but whether or not he could still execute them was questionable. 
And that was so hard. He recalled. I'd probably drop you if we tried it today. Just for fun, we should give it a try, she suggested with a cute, whimsical smile. Why don't you come over tonight? My parents are away and I still have the music. Zach's heart raced. He would love to dance with Melissa again. She'd be back in his arms. All of a sudden, old feelings rushed back in full force. I actually broke up with Shane, she added. He's going to Ottawa for college, you know. Yeah, Jake was telling me. Ottawa is far away. Too far to come home for weekends. Hesitation, Zach looked into her smiling eyes. Melissa was finally free, and now he wished that she wasn't. At that very moment, Zach felt his phone vibrate. He reached into his pocket to check the incoming message and saw it was a text from Hannah. I heard the terrible news about Uncle James. Mom and Dad want to drive out to see him. Maybe I'll see you next weekend, God willing. Please tell him he's in our prayers. Love, Hannah. Zach took a deep breath. Hannah's message gave him strength. I think I'll pass on tonight, he said. I'm working at my grandma's today to clean up from the storm. And my uncle is really sick. He's in the hospital. Changing the subject quickly, he asked, What are you up to? Just hanging out with some friends, she replied, rather surprised by his flat turned down. Walmart has half price on beach towels, so we're heading over to get some. Teasingly, she asked, Do you want one? I already have three. That should do you, she giggled. Reaching over, she touched Zach's new leather bracelet. He let her pull his arm closer. What does it say? She begged sweetly, trying to read it. A new man in Christ, he told her plainly. Is that from when you were ba baptized, she asked, somewhat unsure of the pronunciation. It is. She nodded uncertainly and then said with reluctance, Well, I guess I should let you get to your job. With a sudden inviting smile, she added, just text me if you change your mind about tonight. Have a good day, he smiled reluctantly. I should get going. Impulsively, Melissa leaned in and kissed him on the cheek. Goodbye, Zach, she said softly, stepping back. I miss you. Yeah, see you, Zach replied, feeling very torn. The kiss was nice. Is she flirting with me or is she serious? He wondered, putting the car in gear and waving out his window as he drove away. D did she ditch Shane for me? Is she looking for a long-term relationship or just a fling? We could be so good together. With his hands on the steering wheel, the new man in Christ's bracelet was easy to see. It was a reminder of the commitment he had made to God. Unfortunately, baptism hadn't taken away any of the old feelings and passions. They were still alive and well. Since his dad and Esther had worked hard the day before to clear the tree-lined driveway at Ocean View Lodge, Zack was able to drive all the way to the garage without any difficulty. He got out of the car and looked around. This was truly his favorite job site. Not only did he love being by the ocean, but he always felt more at home here than anywhere else. It was sad to see so many broken trees and fallen limbs on the lawns. The shoreline had changed shape along the cliffs due to incoming waves, and a lot of seaweed was tangled in the low-lying bushes. I'll clean it up in time, he told himself, but it may take a few days. Glancing over at the purple door, he half expected to see Uncle James saunter out to join him as he so often did on a Saturday morning. Grandma and Aunt Sandra always made sure that he had numerous refreshment breaks and some creative cooking to sample. Since the beginning of summer, Aunt Sandra had started making the best fruit smoothies, and Grandma's cookies were second to none. This Saturday was quite different, however. Uncle James was in the hospital. Although their car was in the driveway, Zach wasn't sure if Aunt Sandra and Grandma were home or not. And instead of the usual mowing lawns and tending gardens, there was a lot of heavy debris to clean up. As he chainsawed fallen trees and stacked the wood alone, his mind kept returning to the images he wished he'd never viewed, and a beautiful face peering in his car window. The encounter had brought it all back, every feeling he'd tried to forget. Melissa was so close. She kissed me. Shane is out of the picture. He's moving to Ottawa. Melissa invited me to dance with her. Not to practice for a performance, but to dance for fun. It, it could be fun. Her parents aren't home. We'll be alone. She wants it that way. I could give it a try and see how things go. She'll always love me more than Jake. I know it. I just have to text and say that I've changed my mind. With a deep sigh, Zach knew that to go would be to invite trouble. With the light of God's word in her life, perhaps one day Melissa would come to understand and appreciate the wisdom of God's ways, 
but that light wasn't there yet. If he was to have any interactions with Melissa, he knew it needed to be fully accountable in a public place with other people around. But I've been hoping she'd want me to be more than a friend for so long, and Jake is taking my place. If I go tonight, she can be mine, I'm sure of it. Maybe if I go, I could spend some time talking to her about the Bible. But I know I won't, he thought with despair, dragging a tarp full of twigs to the compost pile. Especially not, he thought, if she starts kissing me again. All it would take was one text. Oh, I hate these thoughts, he exclaimed aloud, dumping the contents of the tarp and shaking it out in disgust. I made a commitment to stop serving sin, but how do I stop my thoughts? But there was no one to answer those questions, and he wasn't sure he would have the nerve to ask anyone had someone appeared. As Zack vented his exasperation, energetically piling up many broken branches on the tarp, Uncle George's solution came to mind. Up at Bible camp, Uncle George had talked about runaway imaginations, especially imaginations that fantasize about other people. Harness your thoughts and efforts to do something for God, Uncle George had counseled. Pray for God's help to edify that person spiritually. Make it your mission to do what you can to help them to do what is right and grow in faith and service to God. Positively pursue the opposite. But I'm so weak and she doesn't want to listen, he thought anxiously. How can I help someone like that? God, please show me what to do. Taking a break from his work, Zach bowed his head quietly to pray, begging for God's help and mercy. Dear Heavenly Father, he prayed, I hate my thoughts. I'm being led astray by my own foolish heart, and I need your help. Please, if Melissa is someone that you are calling... Please give me wisdom to know how I can help her. If she's only leading me astray, please give me strength to overcome. I'm so weak. The brief moment Zach spent in prayer fortified his mind. He was able to think things through in a more rational way when he was done. He now felt fully convinced that to go to Melissa's house in such a situation was to embrace temptation. He knew God's advice is to flee, not to make provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. And Hannah and Noah might be coming next weekend, he reminded himself. All of a sudden, he stopped and marveled. How amazing that Hannah texted me when she did. That text helped me so much. Was it providential? He couldn't be sure, but the message had come at just the right moment. What if I hadn't met Hannah this summer? He considered. Or reconnected with my other good friends? What if I hadn't had time to think about where my life was heading and realized that I wanted to turn it around? Where would I be right now? What would I be choosing? He smiled to himself. I feel like God sent me to camp, kicking and screaming, because he knew that's where I needed to be. The thought that God might be watching over him and lending a hand strengthened his resolve. The door opened and Aunt Sandra stepped out with the tray. You're here! Zach exclaimed. Yes, I'm waiting for your Uncle Peter to come by. He's going to come with us to the hospital. Aunt Sandra's eyes were full of anxiety when she brought over the iced lemonade. Uh, how's Uncle James? Zack asked. Not good at all, Aunt Sandra said with dismay. Zack was disappointed. But he's been on the drip since Tuesday. Why isn't he getting better? I need to go see him. He looked around the yard. There were still many broken branches and limbs scattered on the ground. Aunt Sandra followed his gaze. Why don't you come with us, Zack? She encouraged. Don't worry about the cleanup. Suddenly emotional, her face contorted with grief. In a high-pitched voice, she added, it just doesn't matter right now. Seeing the tears well up in her lovely blue eyes, Zach reached out to give his aunt a hug. He didn't know what to say, but he tried. He'll be okay, Aunt Sandra. He's going to get better. I hope so, Zach, she sobbed. I couldn't, I couldn't bear to. Aunt Sandra could say no more, and Zach patted her back awkwardly as she tried to control herself. Finally, she shook her head silently, gave a little wave, and fled back to the house. About five minutes later, Uncle Peter arrived in the McKinley's van with all his family in tow. Hey, Zack! His uncle called out as he opened the door of the van. Good to see you. It's been well over a year. Looking around quickly at the mess of broken branches, he added, Are you doing this all by yourself? You need help. Greeting his uncle and aunt with enthusiasm, Zack explained that Hurricane Kennedy had brought disaster all over town. Almost everyone is helping somewhere today, he shrugged. When he looked into the back of the van, there were three sets of shy little eyes peering at him. Zach held out his arms with a smile. Hey, who's going to give me a hug? Jimmy and Seth were quick to jump out, but Susanna hung back timidly, holding tightly to her dad. 
A year was a long time in her short life. She wasn't so sure about Zack. We should get the Eden Tree crew out tomorrow afternoon and help the neighbors. Uncle Peter suggested. There are probably a lot of people who don't have anyone to help them. I'm on board for that. Zack agreed, hugging his little cousins. And I can imagine there are others in the meeting who will join us. Winking at Susanna, Zack held out his hand, but there was no way she was coming over. Uncle Peter picked his daughter up and held her close. Coyly, she turned her little face away and would not look at Zack. Susanna takes a little while to warm up, Uncle Peter told Zack. But when she decides she likes you, you're her friend for life. Isn't that right, sweetie pie? He asked, tickling her tummy. There was a giggle, and two little arms squeezed her daddy's neck tight, but she kept her face hidden in his shirt. She's the most like her mommy, Uncle Peter said quietly with a wink in Zack's direction. Aunt Jessica looked over with an amused smile. You mean the outgoing part, she teased. With a laugh, Uncle Peter pulled his wife close. Definitely the friend for life. Zack carried the two boys in for a quick bite of lunch and then headed off with Grandma, Uncle Peter, and Aunt Sandra to the hospital. Aunt Jessica stayed back to look after their children. Everyone was happy to see each other again, but with all the anxiety over Uncle James, the conversation soon centered on what was happening at the hospital. Are Thomas and Purity here as well? Aunt Sandra asked. Yes. Uncle Peter nodded. We were all on the same flight, but they'll visit later on with Kara. They don't want to overwhelm James with too many people at once. At the hospital, Uncle James was breathing with difficulty when they slipped into his room. He was still hooked up to the IV drip and a monitor. An oxygen mask lay nearby. When Uncle Peter called out to him, he slowly opened his eyes. Beat? He questioned, looking up wearily. He glanced around the room with confusion. You're, you're here? Uncle Peter reached over and clasped his brother's hand. Jess and I have flown back for a visit, especially to see you. I'm sorry you're so sick, James. I'll get over it, Uncle James said weakly with a half smile, but then he went into a coughing fit. Aunt Sandra was instantly by his side, trying to help him sit up and get rid of the phlegm. Zack could hardly believe how raspy his uncle's breathing sounded. When the attack was over, Uncle James rested back against the pillows. He looked so pale and weak. Aunt Sandra settled herself on the edge of the bed, and at his request, she placed the oxygen mask on his face. Zack found chairs so they could all sit around the bed. After his bout of coughing, Uncle James didn't try to talk again. He did his best to nod or shake his head as they told him about the various events of the last 24 hours, but soon his eyes began to close and he fell back to sleep. It was disturbing to hear the rattling sound of Uncle James' labored breathing. As the others talked, Aunt Sandra didn't take her eyes off her husband for more than a minute. She clung tightly to one of his hands, and Uncle Peter held onto the other. They hadn't been in the room long when Zack's dad joined them. It was his second visit that day. Pete, so good to see you, he called out cheerfully. But the smile on his face faded when he heard James' troubled breathing. Pulling up one of the chairs that Zack had brought over, Andrew didn't voice his deep concern for Uncle James' condition. Even though it looked like his brother was sleeping, there was always a chance that he might be listening. It would do no good to cause alarm. They were all troubled. No one knew what to make of it. Surely Uncle James would recover, but it was worrisome how much worse he was getting. Jake and Esther didn't come with you? Uncle Peter remarked disappointedly. Zach's dad shook his head. With that wild storm we had, there were trees down everywhere. Jake's helping Brett with his yard today, and Esther and Lisa are helping the McKinleys. Everyone will be at Mum's tonight for dinner, though. Uncle Peter nodded. Mum says Jake's spending a lot of time with Brett. Yeah, I thought it was a good thing at the start. You know, it's better to be playing sports and stay active than hanging out with kids in town that have nothing much to do. But now... Zach's dad shook his head anxiously. Well, everything just seems to be getting out of balance. In what way? Uncle Peter asked. Well, Zach's dad hesitated, glancing quickly in Zach's direction. In in several ways, he sighed. Like, like you, Pete, I believe that sports is a great way for kids to learn how to work with others, how to be part of a team. We always tried to make sure that we do our part to support the team and, and, and be on time, but the games never came before God. Turning to Zach, his dad asked, Do you remember the year that you and Jake couldn't play because the practice conflicted with Friday night youth group activities? Zack nodded. And you never let us play Sunday mornings. True. But it's been a struggle lately to keep it all in perspective, hasn't it, Zack? But that's because we have a good chance at winning the Provincials next season. Zack spoke up defensively. It's a -a once-in-a-lifetime chance, Dad. His dad looked helplessly at his brother Peter and said no more. Uncle Peter looked thoughtful. 
Tell Jake that I'd like to take him out for lunch sometime next week. Maybe he and I can have a chat. Then Uncle Peter looked over at Zack. And I'll help you finish that yard work tonight, he promised. Zack grinned. <laughs> Thanks, Uncle Peter. They stayed in the hospital room for another hour while Uncle James slept restlessly. When prompted, Uncle Peter told them about the mission work he had been doing in Jamaica. Zack was fascinated. Hearing about his uncle and aunt visiting poor brethren and sisters that lived alone in mountainous places, about them putting on puppet plays to teach Bible stories to eager groups of children, hearing about them driving around rugged dirt roads to reach remote villages and visit interested friends, it all sounded like an exciting, life-transforming challenge. Suddenly, a new realization hit Zack. Has it really been Brett I've been unwilling to disappoint? He thought to himself. Or have I only been justifying my own desires? Jesus has done far more for me than Brett. Jesus gave up his whole life to save us. His whole life was consumed with living for God. He never spent any time following his own desires. And Jesus asked us to follow him. Maybe... Zack thought with a heart-wrenching twist. Maybe I could give up my Super 12 year. I could leave basketball behind. I could leave my future in God's hands. A year in Jamaica with Uncle Peter will be a chance to positively pursue the opposite of all that pulls me backwards here. I can spend my time serving others and serving God. And it might even be an adventure that I'd like to have. This sounds really exciting, Zack said to his uncle. Maybe I should join you in September. Both his father and his uncle looked up immediately. That would be great, Uncle Peter said. Why do you want to go? His father questioned skeptically. Zack was surprised by his father's skepticism. Shouldn't you be happy that I want to go? His father tried to shed his skeptical look. Sorry, Zack. He apologized. I'm still adjusting to the new Zack. I shouldn't have looked at you like that. It's great that you want to do missionary work, if it's for the right reasons, but you've only just been baptized. It would probably be better for you to grow spiritually and develop here in your own ecclesia first. There's plenty to do here. Lots of young people to encourage and CYC classes to give. It just seems to me that it's best to develop with some solid Bible study and commitment at home before heading off to influence others overseas. Feeling a little deflated, Zack sat back in his chair. You feel he needs mentoring? Uncle Peter clarified. Exactly. It's not like he'll be going there on his own. Uncle Peter reminded his brother. True. Zack's father acknowledged. He sighed. Why do you want to go, Zack? He asked his son kindly. Tell me. I want to know your reasons. Is it an adventure you're after, or something more? I can hardly say that an adventure doesn't sound appealing, Zack admitted slowly. The smile on his uncle's face encouraged him to continue. Dad, I've been thinking things over, and I'd like to make some big changes in my life, for good. I'd like to take the focus off me and what I want, and put it on God and what I can give. It's hard to do it here. There's a lot pulling me backwards. His father nodded slowly. No one spoke for a moment or two. I guess you will have your uncle and Uncle Thomas, and there is an established ecclesia in Jamaica. Having thought about the idea for quite some time, Uncle Peter explained the work he hoped to give Zach. He was sure there would be plenty of Bible study, pastoral care, leadership at the vacation Bible camps, and best of all, involvement with the youth conference. Having Zach there, and Jake too if possible, Uncle Peter said, will encourage the other teens to participate. If they can see our teens excited about studying the Bible and living their life for Christ, it will help to motivate them to become more involved. Andrew listened carefully to his brother and seemed to warm up to the idea. I'm not trying to discourage you, Zach, he told his son. I do believe there's a lot of good you can do right here in Sterling, and plenty of teens that need encouragement. But I understand that helping out in Jamaica could be a really positive experience. I'll support your decision, whichever you choose. Before anything more could be said, Uncle Thomas and Aunt Purity arrived with Thomas's mother, Kara, there were affectionate greetings all around once more, and then the others decided to leave. Uncle James was still sleeping, and Aunt Sandra wouldn't be lonely now with all the newcomers. Chapter 30 a talk with Uncle Peter. The sun was just beginning to set when Zack and Uncle Peter headed outside that evening to finish the cleanup. Aunt Jessica had made a fabulous meal, and all the family members that were able to come enjoyed it. Uncle Thomas and Aunt Purity had come to dinner as well, 
along with Uncle Thomas's mother, Kara. Now Aunt Jessica was reading her children a story before they went to bed, and Zach's dad was driving off with a plate full of food to take to Aunt Sandra. Everyone understood that Aunt Sandra wouldn't be leaving her husband again until he was well on the road to recovery. Surely he'd be better soon. Uncle James was in the best place possible, and they all felt fairly confident that with prayer and good medicine, he'd be home in a few days. Before the cleanup began, Uncle Peter and Zach walked around the gardens. Uncle Peter gave his nephew tips that would help the plants grow better and pointed out perennials that were getting so big they would need to be divided in September and transplanted. After they brought out the lawn tractor and trailer to haul away the broken branches, Zach told his uncle that he was serious about mission work. Zach, I would love that! Uncle Peter exclaimed with delight. Look, I'll pay your way out if you'll come for the year. There's so much you and Jay could do to help the young people, he encouraged. There are three teen guys who haven't committed their lives to Christ yet. They're still trying to determine which path to choose, and we're also keen to run a youth conference. There's a large group of young people that live long distances apart. It would do them all so much good to do the study and, and then get together to talk about the Bible. Since you're attending the youth conference this year, you could bring back some ideas for us. As they picked up the littered branches and tossed them into the trailer, Zach remembered a conversation he'd had at camp. Uncle Peter, he said thoughtfully, I hope you can talk Jake into coming too. But, but if we can't, Noah Vandenberg wants to do missionary work. Could he come along? There's enough for you, Jake, and Noah to keep busy, Uncle Peter assured him. Really? Of course. Can I text Noah right now? Sure. Zach took out his phone and eagerly punched in the news. For the first time ever, Noah responded immediately. He was very eager to be involved. From that point on, the conversation between Zach and his uncle became quite animated. While they labored together cleaning up, they discussed all the possibilities ahead of them. Time went by quickly. Uncle Peter was so enthusiastic about Zach's abilities that Zach dreaded to tell him about the struggles he was having. However, he knew he wanted to talk to someone that he looked up to, and Uncle Peter was right there, ready and available. After the fourth load of branches was dumped near the garden shed, Zach mustered his courage to talk to his uncle. Filling the trailer with what they hoped would be the last load of broken limbs, Zach asked, Uncle Peter... Did you watch many movies before you were baptized? <laughs> Too many. Bad ones? Unfortunately, yes. I spent ten years of my life running away from God. I have a lot of regrets. Zach wasn't sure what to say next, so he didn't say anything. He just kept piling wood. Well, why do you ask, Zach? Well, because I saw one the other week, and I can't get it out of my mind. Heaving a large branch into the back of the trailer, Uncle Peter turned to face his nephew. It's not easy, I know, he replied compassionately. We can so quickly forget the good exhortation we hear on a Sunday or the Bible readings we did the night before. Yet worldly images keep blasting into our minds, even when we come to detest them and would love to find a way to delete them permanently. You still struggle with them? Nodding solemnly, Uncle Peter admitted, Yes, although not nearly as much as I used to. The last movie I watched like that was while I was still living in Australia and running away from God. But even today, on a Sunday morning, I can be sitting happily next to my beautiful wife, fully absorbed in the exhortation I'm listening to, and one of those images will just strike me out of the blue. Before I know it, my mind has been taken some place that I didn't want to go. Zack sighed. It was reassuring to know that Uncle Peter, a man he highly respected, and a good example in many ways, understood the problem he was having. So, what what do you do about it? He asked earnestly. Don't feed it, Uncle Peter told him firmly. That's step number one. This world is corrupt. Try as we might, we can't completely stop ourselves from seeing things that excite our base nature. But when you have a choice, Zach, never choose to feed the flesh. The more you feed the flesh, whether through lustful movies, games, addictive novels, abusing alcohol or drugs, or the vast array of trash found on the internet, the stronger the pull becomes for more. Eventually, you want to start doing the things you've been seeing and hearing and reading about. Even if you do those things, you still won't be satisfied. The flesh never is. You'll have to keep increasing your level of indulgence to reach the same level of gratification all the while searing your conscience 
and making it so much harder to maintain fellowship with God. It's a vicious downward cycle. Is there any way to reverse it at all? Uncle Peter smiled and stretched out his shoulders. They hadn't finished the cleanup, and it was getting dark, but the conversation was a higher priority. It's very difficult while we're in this mortal body, he replied. Even if we were to go and escape to some remote island with no electrical outlets or billboards or any other people, we'd still find our nature capable of inventing wickedness all on its own. Sawing a few large branches so they would fit more easily into the trailer, Uncle Peter told him, Another thing that helps me when my mind is repeatedly going down a path I don't want it to is to instantly stop and pray for forgiveness and God's help. We can, to a certain extent, change the path our minds take by putting up mental stop signs and asking God to be involved. Mental stop signs. Is that considered with a smile? I'll have to try that, he told his uncle. As Uncle Peter walked to the far edge of the lawn to get one last branch, a message came through on Zach's cell. Zach stopped to take a look. It was from Melissa. Just wondering if you're coming over tonight. I found our music. I'm so glad I'm here with Uncle Peter, Zach thought. This is more temptation than I can handle. I need to overcome evil with good. Somehow I've got to let her know I have a new allegiance. Zach texted back. Sorry, Melissa. I'm helping my uncle tonight. I've made a decision to be a new man in Christ. If you ever want to know why this has changed me, I'd be happy to tell you. Zach paused and took a deep breath before pressing send. He was fairly certain Melissa would understand the implications of the message. It could well be the end of her flirtatious advances, which he would miss, but found very difficult to handle. Mustering his resolve, he pressed the arrow, the message sent. I'll tell you what helps me even more, Uncle Peter added, as he returned, dragging the large branch behind him. What's that? Learning to love God. Okay, but I do love God. I'm sure you do, Uncle Peter nodded as Zach helped him wrestle the last branch into the trailer. But does God feel loved by you? Zach looked over at his uncle with a quizzical expression. Over and over, he had heard how much God loves his creation, but no one had ever asked him if God felt loved by him in return. Well, I thank God for for all the love he has shown to us, Zach stuttered. I'm sure he knows I'm sincere. Wiping the sweat off his forehead, Uncle Peter took a seat on the garden tractor. I hope you never experienced this, Zach, he said with a grin. But sometimes people fall in love with being loved. They may enjoy getting all the attention, the gifts, and the letters, but never really love the giver of that love. In his mind, Zach imagined himself lavishing gifts and flowers on Melissa. He could see her reveling in the beautiful things she was receiving. What if she only loved all the flattering attention, but never really cared about him as a person? That would stink. It would. And we can do the same with God and Jesus. We can be thankful and happy for all the love they have shown to us, but never fall in love with who they are. How can you tell the difference? Well, if we really love someone, we will want to find out all about them. We will want to know what pleases them. We will go to great extents to discover what is most important to them and do our best to bring happiness to their lives, right? Right. So, we know we are falling in love with God when we want to make the effort to get to know Him, when we get excited about His plan and purpose for us and this earth and are in awe of His morality and His commands. And what if we don't feel that excitement? Cocking his head to one side, Uncle Peter replied, Force yourself to find out more about them and you will fall in love. When you understand who Jesus was, his selfless character, his motivation to give his life for the world, you will want to be like him and his father. Zach nodded. He understood. Even the study he was doing every evening on Job's interaction with God was pulling him in the right direction. The more we learn to love God and his son and desire to bring them pleasure, Uncle Peter added, the more we will stop longing for things that bring them grief. It made sense to Zack, but he knew how close he had been to causing grief only moments before. He moaned, I'm just not sure if I'll ever get there. My thoughts are sometimes totally corrupt. It was getting dark. Zack knew his uncle needed to get the last load to the shed so they could unload the wood. 
He picked up the saws and rakes and put them in the trailer. Pulling the tractor keys out of his pocket, Uncle Peter held them in his hands, but he didn't start the engine. Brett has been a great coach for you and Jake through the years, right? He's fair and considerate. Zach agreed. So, Brett's not going to kick you off the team for missing ten shots if he sees you're putting in your best effort. Nobody might sub in another player. True, he might feel that you need some time out, but that would be for your benefit, right? Zach nodded. But if you or Jake were to rest on your laurels as the team captains, or feel that you could get by with minimum effort, you might be benched for the game. Of course. With a smile, Uncle Peter expanded his analogy. God knows we're going to make mistakes and, and that we can't be perfect, but he's reading our hearts and minds. He simply asks us to give all that we can. He knows better than any coach if we are really trying or just coasting. Pausing to look over at Zack, Uncle Peter added with a smile, God is on your side, Zack. He wants you to win every time. If you ask him, he'll work in your life to help change your heart.